Hello, welcome to Tennessee's At Home Learning Series for Literacy. Today's lesson is for eighth grade ELA students, although anyone's welcome to join in. This lesson is the fourth in our series. My name is Mr. Ayers and I am an eighth grade ELA teacher in Tennessee schools. I am so excited to be your teacher for this lesson and welcome to my virtual classroom. Today, we'll be learning about characters in context. Before we get started to participate fully in our lesson, you're going to need a few things. You need something to write with, something to write on, and a piece of blank paper. If you didn't see our previous lesson, you can find it online. You can still tune in to today's lesson if you haven't seen any of our others, but it might be more fun if you go back and watch the other lessons first, since we'll be talking about things we've learned previously. Today's focus continues looking at the narrative point of view, but we want to look more in depth at characters in context. Okay, let's get started. Today, we will analyze a literary passage in order to determine its meaning and the importance of point of view and conveying that meaning. On a piece of paper, I'd like for you to draw the chart that you see on the screen. It's going to have three columns, and at the top of the first column, I want you to write the words character. At the top of the second column, write feeling or emotion, and at the top of the third column, write textual evidence. I'll give you just a second to write that. Great. Now I'm going to read a few paragraphs of our text, The Ransom of Red Chief. As I am read, I'm going to begin to fill out the chart like I would want you to fill out your chart you've just made, making notes about how Red Chief feels about being kidnapped and how the kidnappers feeling, feel about Red Chief. Be sure to write the character name, a word or words to describe, and how you know based on the text. For right now, you can use my answers to start off your table, your chart. So follow along as I read. Bill was pasting court plaster all over the scratches and bruises on his features. There was a fire burning behind the big rock at the entrance of the cave, and the boy was watching a pot of boiling coffee with two buzzard tail feathers stuck in his red hair. He points a stick at me when I come up and says, Ha! Ah, curse pale face! Do you dare to enter the camp of Red Chief, the terror of the plains? He's all right now, says Bill, rolling up his trousers and examining some bruises on his shins. We're playing Indian. We're making Buffalo Bill's show look like ma magic lantern views of Palestine in the town hall. I'm old Hank, the trapper, Red Chief's captive, and I'm to be scalped at daybreak. By Geronimo, that kid can kick hard. Okay, so in this first section of text, the first character that I was introduced to was Bill. So I'm going to write Bill's name in the first column. Then I'm going to think about how Bill must be feeling based on what I read. So let's see. Um, he's all scratched and bruised, and later he says that the kid can kick hard. So I'm going to write scared and or mad in the next column. Next, I need to think about textual proof. I'm going to go back to the fact that the text says he's bruised and he's looking at where the kid kicked him. I think that would prove my feelings about Bill being both angry and scared. Next, I was introduced to Red Chief or the kid. So again, I'm going to write Red Chief or the kid in the first column. Next, I'm going to think about 
what he must be feeling right now. I'm going to write in the second column something like in charge or happy. Now I have to support that from the text I read. I'm going to write in the third column something like Bill is his captive, so that means that the kid is feeling in charge or power in power. Also, he's dancing around with feathers in his hair. It seems like he must be really enjoying himself, so that means he's having fun. All right, let's try one together. Listen and follow along as I read. Yes, sir. That boy seemed to be having the time of his life. The fun of camping out in a cave had made him forget that he was a captive himself. He immediately christened me Snake Eye, the spy, and announced that when his braves returned from the warpath, I was to be broiled at the stake at the rising of the sun. So now you try to come up with a word that you could use to describe Red Chief in this paragraph and why. Let me give you about 30 seconds to see what you can come up with. Great. So let's take a look at what I wrote down. I said that he was really happy. My textual proof for this is the first line says that he was having the time of his life. I also use the fact that though he had totally forgotten that he was a prisoner, in fact, he was taking his kidnappers prisoners instead. Now, I'm going to read a few paragraphs at a time and then let you listen and think about what I have read to you and what you've seen on the screen. I want you to listen closely and make some notes about the characters. As I stop, I want you to fill out the chart that we've made using the same process that we have just gone over. I will read slowly and stop occasionally to give you some time to catch up. Follow along as I read. Yes, sir, that boy seemed to be having the time of his life. The fun of camping out in a cave had made him forget that he was a captive himself. He immediately christened me Snake Eye, the spy, and announced that when his braves returned from the warpath, I was to be broiled at the stake at the rising of the sun. Then we had supper. And, his, and he filled his mouth full of bacon and bread and gravy and began to talk. He made a during dinner speech something like this. I like this vine. I never camped out before, but I had a pet possum once and I was nine last birthday. I hate to go to school. Rats ate up some 16 of Jimmy Talbot's Aunt Speckled Hen eggs. Are there any real Indians in these woods? I want some more gravy. Does the trees move make the wind blow? We had five puppies. What makes your nose so red, Hank? My father has lots of money. Are the stars hot? I whipped Ed Walker twice Saturday. I don't like girls. You doesn't catch toads unless with a string. Do oxen make any noise? Why are oranges round? Have you got beds to sleep on in this cave? Amos Murray has got six toes. A parrot can talk, but a monkey or fish can't. How many does it take to make 12? Every few minutes, he would remember that he was a pesky redskin and pick up his stick rifle and tiptoe to the mouth of the cave to rubber for scouts of the, ha the hated pale face. Now and then, he would let out a war whoop that made old Hank the Trapper shiver. That boy had Bill terrorized from the start. Reggie, says I to the kid, would you like to go home? Oh, what for, says he. I don't have any fun at home. I hate to go to school. I like to camp out. You won't take me back home again, Snake Eye, will you? Not right away, says I. Well, we'll stay here in the cave for a while. 
All right, says he, that'll be fine. I never had such fun in all my life. We went to bed about 11 o'clock. We spread down some wide blankets and quilts and put Red Chief between us. We weren't afraid he'd run away. He kept us awake for three hours, jumping up and reaching for his rifle and, and screeching. His part in mine and Bill's ear as the fancied crackle of a twig or the rustle of a leaf revealed to this young imagination the stealthy approach of the outlaw band. <sighs> At last, I fell into a troubled sleep and dreamed that I had been kidnapped and chained to a tree by a ferocious pirate with red hair. All right. So now on your chart, I want you to write kid, the kid in the character column. And then take a second to see if you can fill out the second column, feeling or emotion, and then some kind of text evidence to go with it. I'm going to give you a few seconds to work on that. Great. What did you write? I put that the kid is definitely excited about staying with the cat kidnappers. The textual evidence proof could be lots of things. One that I'm sure that you thought about and wrote down was in paragraph 22. The kid didn't settle down for two hours after bedtime. All right, let's keep going. Just at daybreak, I was awakened by a series of awful screams from Bill. They weren't yells or howls or shouts or whoops or yaps, such as you expect from a manly set of vocal organs. They were simply indecent, terrifying, humiliating screams, such as women emit when they see ghosts or caterpillars. It's an awful thing to hear a strong, desperate, fat man scream incontently in a cave at daybreak. I jumped up to see what the matter was. Red Chief was sitting on Bill's chest with one hand twined in Bill's hair and in the other he had the sharp case knife we use for slicing bacon and he was industrially and realistically trying to take Bill's scalp according to the sentence that he had pronounced upon him the evening before. I got the knife away from the kid and made him lie down again. But from that moment, Bill's spirit was broken. He lay down on his side of the bed, but he never closed an eye again in sleep as long as that boy was with us. I dozed off for a while, but along towards sunup, I remembered that Red Chief had said I was to be burned at the stake at the rising of the sun. I wasn't nervous or afraid, but I sat up and lit my pipe and leaned against the rock. What are you getting up so soon for, Sam? asked Bill. Me, says I. Oh, I got a kind of pain in my shoulder. I thought sitting up would rest it. You're a liar, says Bill. You are afraid. You was to be burned at sunrise, and you was afraid he'd do it. And he would, too, if he could find a match. Ain't it awful, Sam? Do you think anybody will pay out money to get a little imp like that back home? Sure, said I. A rowdy kid like that is just the kind that parents dote on. Now, you and the chief get up and cook breakfast while I go to the top of this mountain and recon air. All right, let's continue practicing. On your chart, on the next two lines, I want you to write Bill, and then I want you to write Sam. And I want you to think about for a minute, what do you think? How are these characters feeling? And then how do you know that based on what we've read in the last seven paragraphs? Take about 30 seconds to think through that.
Great. All right, so here's what I wrote. Remember that your answers do not have to exactly match mine. I said that Bill is feeling scared and defeated. My text evidence is that Bill was screaming in paragraph 24 because he thought he was about to be scalped. To support that he was defeated, I use paragraph 25 when it simply states that Bill was defeated. All right, the next line is Sam. This one seems a little bit more difficult. I said that Sam was feeling scared too, but that he doesn't really want to admit it. I'm thinking about paragraph 25, 27, and it shows this by Sam using the excuse of his shoulder was hurting him. That's why he was up so early. All right, let's keep reading. I went up on the peak of the little mountain and ran my eye over the contiguous vicinity. Over towards summit, I expected to see the sturdy, Yemenry of the village armed with cis and pitchforks beating the countryside for the, the dastardly kidnappers. But what I saw was a peaceful landscape doted with one man plowing with a dun mule. Nobody was dragging the creek. No couriers dashed hither and yon bringing tidings of no news to the distracted parents. There was a sylvan attitude of somnolent sleepiness pervading that section of the external outward surface of Alabama that lay exposed to my view. Perhaps, says I to myself, it has not yet been discovered that the wolves has borne away the tender lambkin from the fold. Heaven help the wolves, says I, and I went down the mountain to breakfast. When I got to the cave, I found Bill backed up against the side of it, breathing hard, and the boy threatening to smash him with a rock half as big as a coconut. He put a red hot boiled potato down my back, exclaimed Bill, and then mashed it with his foot, and I boxed his ears. Have you got a gun about you, Sam? I took the rock away from the boy and kind of patched up the argument. I'll fix you, says the kid to Bill. No man ever struck the red chief of what he got paid for it. You better beware. After breakfast, the kid takes a piece of leather with strings wrapped around it out of his pocket and goes outside the cave, unwinding it. What's he up to now, says Bill anxiously. You don't think he'll run away, do you, Sam? No fear of it, says I. He don't seem to be much of a homebody, but we've got to fix up some plan about the ransom. There don't seem to be much excitement around Summit on account of his disappearance. But maybe they haven't realized yet that he's gone. His parents may think he's spending the night with Aunt Jane or one of the neighbors. Anyhow, he'll be missed today. Tonight, we must get a message to his father demanding the $2,000 for his return. Just then, we heard kind of a war whoop, such as David might have admitted when he knocked out the champion Goliath. It was a sling that Red Chief had pulled out of his pocket, and he was whirling it around his head. I dodged and heard a heavy thud and a kind of sigh from Bill, like a horse gives out when you take his saddle off. A rock the size of an egg had caught Bill just behind his left ear. He loosened himself all over and fell in the fire across the frying pan of hot water for washing the dishes. I dragged him out and poured cold water on his head for half an hour. By and by, Bill sits up and feels behind his ears and says, Sam, do you know who my favorite biblical character is? Take it easy, says I. You'll come to your senses presently. King Herod, says he, you won't go away and leave me alone here, will you, Sam? I went out and caught that boy and shook him until his freckles rattled. If you don't behave, says I, I'll take you straight home. Now, are you going to be good or not? I was only funny, he said sullenly. I didn't mean to hurt old Hank. But what did he hit me for? I'll behave, Snake Eye, if you won't send me home, and if you'll let me play the Black Scout today. I don't know the game, says I. That's for you and Mr. Bill to decide. He's your playmate for the day. I'm going away for a while on business. Now you come in and make friends with him and say you're sorry for hurting him, or you go home at once. You know, Sam, says Bill, I've stood by you without batting an eye in earthquakes, fire, and flood, in poker games, dynamite, outrages, police raids, train robberies, and cyclones. 
I never lost my nerve yet till we kidnapped that two-legged skyrocket of a kid. He's got me going. You won't leave me long with him, will you, Sam? I'll be back sometime this afternoon, says I. You must keep the boy amused and quiet until I return. And now we'll write the letter to old Dorset. Bill and I got paper and pencil and worked on the letter while Red Chief, with a blanket wrapped around him, strutted up and down, guarding the mouth of the cave. Bill begged me tearfully to make the ransom $1,500 instead of $2,000. I ain't attempting, says he, to decry the celebrated moral aspect of parental affection, but we're dealing with humans, and it ain't human for anybody to give up $2,000 for that 40-pound chunk of freckled wildcat. I'm willing to take a chance at $1,500. You can charge the difference up to me. So, to relieve Bill, I seated, and we collaborated a letter that ran this way. Ebenezer Dorset, Esquire. We have your boy concealed in a place far from Summit, it is useless for you or the most skillful detectives to attempt to find him. Absolutely the only terms on which you can have him restored to you are these. We demand $1,500 in large bills for his return, the money to be left at midnight tonight at the same spot and in the same box as your reply, as here and after described. If you agree to these terms, send your answer in writing by a solitary messenger tonight at half past eight o'clock after crossing Owl Creek on the road to Poplar Cove. There are three large trees about 100 miles yards apart, close to the fence of the wheat field on the right-hand side. At the bottom of the fence post, opposite the third tree, will be found a small pasteboard box. The messenger will place the answer in this box and return immediately to Summit. If you attempt any treachery or fail to comply with our demands as stated, you will never see your boy again. If you pay the money as demanded, he will be returned to you safe and well within three hours. These terms are final, and if you do not accede to them, no further communication will be attempted. Two desperate men. I addressed the letter to Dorset and put it in my pocket. As I was about to start, the kid comes up to me and says, Oh, Snake Eye, you said I could play the Black Scout while you were gone. Play it, of course, says I. Mr. Bill will play with you. What kind of game is it? I'm the Black Scout, says Red Chief, and I have to ride to the stockade to warn the settlers that the Indians are coming. I'm tired of playing Indian myself. I want to be the Black Scout. All right, says I. It sounds harmless to me. I guess Mr. Bill will help you foil the pesky savages. What am I to do? asked Bill, looking at the kids suspiciously. You are the boss, says Black Scout. Get down on your hands and knees. How can I ride you to the stockade without a hoss? You better keep him interested, said I, till we get the scheme going. Loosen up. Bill gets down on all fours and, look, and a look comes in his eye like a rabbit's when you catch it in a trap. How far is it to the stockade, kid, he asked in a husky manner of voice. Ninety miles, says the black scout, and you have to hump yourself to get there on time. Whoa, now. The black scout jumps on Bill's back and digs his heels in his side. For heaven's sake, says Bill, hurry back, Sam, as soon as you can. I wish we hadn't made the ransom more than a thousand. Say you quit kicking me or I'll get up and warm you good. I walked over to Poplar Cove and sat around the post office and store talking with the child bacons that came in to trade. One whiskering says that he hears someone is all upset on account of Elder Ebenezer Dorset's boy being lost or stolen. That's all I wanted to know. I bought some smoking tobacco, referred casually to the price of black-eyed peas, posted my letter serendipitously, and came away. The postmaster said the mail carrier would come by in an hour to take the mail on to Summit. When I got back to the cave, Bill and the boy were not to be found. I explored the vicinity of the cave and risked a yodel or two, but there was no response. So I lighted my pipe and sat down on a mossy bank to await developments. In about an hour, I heard the bushes rustle and Bill wobbled out into the little glade in front of the cave. Behind him was the kid, stepping softly like a scout with a broad grin on his face. Bill stopped, took off his hat, and wiped his face with a red handkerchief. The kid stopped about eight feet behind him. Sam, says Bill, 
I suppose you'll think I'm a renegade, but I couldn't help it. I'm a grown person with masculine masculine proclivities and habits of self-defense. But there is a time when all systems of egotism and predominance fail. The boy is gone. I have sent him home. All is off. There was martyrs in old times, goes on Bill, that suffered death rather than give up the particular graft they enjoyed. None of them ever was subjugated to such supernatural tortures as I have been. I tried to be faithful to our articles of depredation, but there came a limit. What's the trouble, Bill? I asked him. I was rogue, said Bill, the 90 miles to the stockade, not bearing an inch. Then when the settlers was rescued, I was given oats. Sand ain't a palatable substitute. And then for an hour, I had to try to explain to him why there was nothing in holes, how a road can run both ways and what makes the grass green, I tell you, Sam, a human can only stand so much. I takes him by the neck of his clothes and drags him down the mountain. On the way, he kicks my legs black and blue from the knees down, and I got two or three bites on my thumb and hand carterized. But he's gone, continues Bill, gone home. I showed him the road to summit and kicked him about eight feet nearer there at one kick. I'm sorry we lose the ransom, but it was either that or Bill Driscoll to the madhouse. Bill is puffing and blowing that there is a look and ineffable peace and growing con content on his rose pink features. Bill, says I, there isn't any heart disease in your family, is there? No, said Bill, nothing chronic except malaria and accidents. Why? All right, so take just a second to look at this. We're gonna continue this in our next lesson. Awesome. I hope that you learned, you enjoyed learning more about Red Chief with me today. Thank you for inviting me to your home and I'll see you next lesson.